Hey guys, and welcome to Petroped, and welcome to the first collaboration review I've done in a long, long time. Today is all about the Audi SQ8, which is parked behind me. I have had loads of questions since I put a video up just a couple of days ago asking for what you would like to know about this car, so I reckon we get cracking. We've got a lot to get through. Now then, before we get cracking, very brief rundown on the spec of the car we got in front of us. This is the Vorsprung model. So the Vorsprung above the normal SQ8 gets air suspension, active anti-roll control and four-wheel steering. This car is in Orca Black Metallic. Again, that is a 750 pound option. But other than that, we'll talk about the Vorsprung spec a bit later on. It is actually quite difficult to add any more than this car's got on it. It's a pretty well spec car. But the first question we'll need to wander around this side of the car, come on. So the first question is from Paul Ellis and he's asked how does it compare to the SQ7 which I drove probably two maybe three years ago. Um, engine wise very very similar 4 litre V8 with a twin turbo and then it's got this 48 volt compressor that spins the turbo up to avoid turbo lag. The big difference is this has got this kind of sport back shape so it kind of goes down a little bit makes the car look a little bit sleeker. The SQ7 has a kind of more squared off rear end and that isn't going to be to everybody's taste but it's really going after that kind of coupe SUV type market. Okay, next question from Octane Parker. Does the car have an artificially induced exhaust sound? Simple answer to that is yes. It has sound actuators in the exhaust, but for me, there's a far bigger fundamental problem to this car. It looks like it has real exhaust and it kind of does. This oval here actually has an exhaust in it. That one is a complete fake blank. There's nothing in there. And I just don't get it. Surely it can't save that much money. It just looks awful from the back. It's not as bad as the SQ5 that has a kind of plastic trim and the exhaust basically pointing down and coming out somewhere here. But I don't like that at all. I actually thought they were real until closer inspection you can actually see the blanking plate on both of the outside tailpipes. Not good. Next important question from Dan Veer. Can you fit two schnauzers in the boot? Yes, of course you can. Now, this boot is absolutely cavernous, way more room than these two monkeys need. But interestingly, if I'd put the sun blind down, as the boot closes, that does come down. So you would probably have to remove that. Um, but yes, now you might find if you've got bigger dogs, and I did have a comment from someone that the SQ7 with it having a slightly more squared off rear probably gives bigger dogs more room, but loads and loads of room for these two. Would you like it in there? Hmm? Or did you like the um, Aston Martin DBX the other week? They were quite good. Go on then, out you get Go. Right, they'll go on to explore now. Next question, far more serious. Can you get a bike in the boot? Now then, F gone, Kevin Edwards and Wordry all wanted to know, can you get a bike in the boot? As you know, I'm a very keen cyclist, so this is a hugely important consumer test. So let me just lean that on there. Hopefully it won't move too much. I am gonna need to drop the rear seats, I think. Da, da, da. Stay. And I'm gonna do this test. I'm gonna try and leave the front wheel on, which is always a good test. Easy peasy. Okay, the next question then is from Senor Bean Flicker. Wanted to know, can you fit three adults in the back? Well, first thing is there's loads of leg room and it's, it does feel very spacious and airy in here, helped a lot, I think, by the panoramic glass roof. The challenge you might have is this center seat really isn't sculpted as a seat. The outside two are, they're really comfortable, but would I want to sit here for a long journey? I do have a bit of a transmission tunnel in front of me. <laughs> Probably not. The seat isn't that comfortable. So I think the answer to the question is, Really, this is probably a four-seat car that has an extra emergency seat or you could put a small child on there and then you'd probably want to kind of pull this down and have some comfort and pop that up and have your drinks in there and chill rather than having three adults in the back. The next question is from Andrew Stewart. While we're sat here, and what, that's what's the rear headroom like? Simple answer, I thought it might be a bit compromised because of the sport back shape of the car, but it really isn't. There's plenty in here. Yeah, I feel very nice and comfortable. So let's jump in the front for the next batch of questions. Now, 
this really is a very beautiful cabin very well appointed so first question from ginger 17 is uh, are these heated and vented seats and yes they are um, and they're very effective too they're very very comfortable seats we'll probably talk more about these when we're out on the road doing a bit of driving but i did have lots and lots of questions about the tech in this car so first question from Irv B and RST was about the infotainment screens on the car. And, and the question was, do these screens affect the safety um, when you're driving? You've got a big TFT screen, the virtual cockpit in front of you, that's out of every Audi. This center console is straight out of the e-tron, the touchscreen technology, um, and everything in this car is touchscreen. Does it affect driver safety or distraction? I don't think so. It's no different to any other modern car. We've got this kind of plethora of large TFT screens displaying all the information that I need. I could link that to the next question then, which was from Dan Greasley. And Dan basically asked, is the infotainment system intuitive or do you kind of need to RTFM, read the manual? Well, I'm not a big manual reader, if I'm honest. That probably comes out in some of my reviews when I might get pointed out things that uh, are often fairly easy if you know how things work. Is it intuitive? I think it is pretty intuitive, to be honest. I am an Audi owner, so therefore, the kind of menus and so on are very similar to my car, which probably helps. Everything is touch screen. There's no jog wheel in this car, so it's all touch screen. Some of it you can do with voice activation. I have to admit, I haven't used the voice activation before. And I know this lovely piano black finish one of the big problems with this touch screen is greasy fingerprints um, and for those of you with a little bit of OCD this car would probably do your head in because you do get little fingerprint marks all over the gloss piano black finish. Now then the next question is from Mini Eggs and it's about wireless Apple CarPlay. In order to demonstrate I'm just going to fire the car up because I've now got my iPhone with me and as long as you've selected or paired your car and iPhone together, um, it automatically detects you've got an iPhone and an Apple CarPlay device in the car. And there we go, an Apple CarPlay is up and running. So anybody who uses Apple CarPlay will know it does have a tendency to drain the battery. No problem in here because underneath this armrest, I've got a wireless charging pad and I drop my phone on there and it wirelessly charges the phone. My phone is charging and that's me done now ha the question was have i had any problems with it dropping out to be honest i've only had a couple i stopped uh, to get some fuel and when i got back in the car for some reason my Waze route had basically defaulted back and, and i had to enter it again but i think that was more of a problem with Waze rather than the um, apple carplay i've been streaming my music through here uh, and it works really really well and i am a big big fan and then the final question from phil higgins is how long does it take to defrost a windscreen. Well, just for you, Phil, I got up early this morning when there was still loads of frost on the car and decided to see how long it would take. Well, as you can see, we had a very heavy frost last night. So let's see just how quickly this very frosty windscreen demists, shall we? Okay, so we are inside the car. I'm gonna use my stopwatch, trusty stopwatch. So let's start the car. Start the stopwatch and basically put maximum blower on. As you can see, the temperature outside is zero degrees. I put maximum blower on, put the rear on as well. Let's just see how long it's going to take to warm up this windscreen. It is properly, properly icy. It's coming up to two minutes. Now we're just starting to get, just there, if you can zoom into it, just starting to get some defrosting happening. So here's three minutes. Four minutes. Now I think we're nearly at that time where if I gave the windscreen a bit of a flick with the wipers we might clear quite a lot of that let's just have a see what that's going to do there we go 
so yeah not not too bad it was a pretty cold morning to be honest now for the next lot of things we need to take this car out on the road because all the remaining questions are about driving the car <laughs> so we're out driving first question from nigel w what do i think of the engine well, it's party piece, it's a diesel, so it's party piece is torque. This thing has enough torque to kickstart a dead planet, basically, 900 Newton meters. It does sound pretty good for a diesel. I know some of that is artificially made, but it, it does sound really good. And it just pulls like a train. You don't get a huge sensation of speed in the car, and it's not the most engaging engine to drive, but it's just biblically powerful. So yeah, very, very impressive. Next question from Roger Kent, does it ride on air suspension? Well, this Wurstsprung model does, um, and the ride quality is exceptional. I'm currently in dynamic mode, which sets the suspension to its stiffest setting, if you like but there's a range of other settings. If you go into individual, you can set it to uh, a range of different, um, whether it's soft or hard. It's got an off-road mode. You can adjust the ride height of the car. It really is quite sophisticated in terms of how you manage the, the suspension. And it's very, very good. It corners so flat, it's unbelievable. This anti-roll stability control system it's got is really very, very impressive. So yes, the air suspension system is very good. Next question then from Mr. LV and Stuart Porter. How does it make you feel driving it? Well, it's a, it's a brilliant car to do long miles in. It's super comfortable. Some of the tech on board helps you do that. So if you are wanting to crunch the miles, for me, this car is brilliant. It makes you kind of really feel that. When you then want to come off of the motorway or dual carriageway and, and have a bit of a sportier drive, it's quick, but it doesn't it doesn't sing to my soul. It doesn't engage me massively. It's just brutally good at what it does. It is, however, very impressive. It does things that a big SUV just shouldn't be able to do. It goes around corners brilliantly. You get on the power brilliantly. It's got so much torque and so much pull that it, it is an impressive car to drive, but it, 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 doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't give me a sense of joy. It's just very accomplished. Now, Terry Carver and Richard Jones both asked similar questions about the adaptive cruise control, the lane assist, and then the autonomous driving features. And I have to say, for me, those things, I'll talk about them all at the same time, they are the most impressive thing, I think, about this car. Um, if you're on a long uh, journey, it just makes that long journey far, far easier. Let's talk about adaptive cruise control, first of all. So adaptive cruise control, I've driven many, many cars with it. You set your speed, it, it does your cruise control, and if you come up behind something that's slower, it just sets a set distance between you and that car and slows you down, and when they pull over, it makes you go past. That, that There's nothing new on that one, and it does that. However, what it also has is, if you pull the um, cruise control paddle towards you, it has what's called predictive control active. Now, what that does is really good. When you set that, it basically sets the cruise control to whatever the speed limit of the road you are on is, and it then changes that speed limit as the speed limits change. So if you're in city driving, and I found this when I went into London earlier this week, it just adapts, you, you're never ever gonna speed. And then what it also does, which is really clever, and I'm gonna overlay some video of this um, now, but what it also does is, if you're on a dual carriageway at 60 and you come up to a roundabout, it knows the roundabout's there, it adjusts your speed down, it slows the car down for you, and I actually drove around a roundabout and out the other side without touching the brake or the throttle. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. That 
that functionality in this car is is as good as I've driven in any car. It's really, really very good. And it's got speed sign recognition as well. So if you have that set and you go into some temporary roadworks, the car spots the speed sign and adjusts the speed accordingly. It's brilliant. It really, if you don't want to speed, I mean, don't this car in one of its guises will lose your license for you, but in that guise, it will keep it for you. Very clever. Okay, next question from Phil Shambrook, Hessel de Bruin and Ali C. They all wanted to know what the uh, headlamps were like. So this has got a standard matrix LED headlamps. Now, if you've seen, I have talked about this in other Audi reviews. I think it was the RS4 uh, when I drove that. That was the first car I had with matrix lamps. And, and I am a huge fan. I think the technology it fascinates me. The, the techie inside of me constantly thinks, how on earth does that work? Now, again, while I'm talking about this, I got some footage driving at night time a couple of days ago. So basically, the way that it works is you, the, the, the car actually works so it just at night time, puts full beam on, and you drive around everywhere with full beam on. However, what the car does is it scans ahead and it recognises cars in front or cars coming the other way. And when that happens, it just knocks out the full beam just for where that car is, but keeps it on everywhere else. So if you're following a car, you'll have your full beam headlights on, illuminating the verges and the trees and stuff, but the car in front won't be getting dazzled. And it's just, it's incredible. And it, it's, it's, well, it's, you don't have to opt for it in this car. It's not an option. It, these cars come with it as standard. But honestly, if you're buying an Audi, and I know other manufacturers have the same technology, it's a definite tick in the box. It's a brilliant, brilliant technology. Okay, I was waiting for this. Kevy 427 wanted to know what the 60 to zero time is. Well, what I thought I'd do, I'm actually gonna do a naught to 60 and back to naught time, because I like doing those. And this car shouldn't be able to do naught to 60 miles an hour in 4.8 seconds, because it's way too heavy to do that. So let's find a nice bit of straight road and do a naught to 60 to naught test. Okay, naught to 60 to naught. Three, two, one, here we go. Go. Oh. 60, oh, and zero. <laughs> yeah, I think the answer to the question is really, really fast. Wow. Next question then from Steve Park and Philip Parks is, this is a big car. Will it fit in a normal car parking space? And related to that was also just the general, what's it like to drive in built up areas? It is a big car, so does it fit in a car park space? Let's go and find out, shall we? We will head to my local supermarket and see just the comparison of car park space size to SQ8. Back into this one. Now, the parking camera is very cool. It's got the 360 degree cameras. So cameras underneath the wing mirrors and so on. I'm just gonna jiggle around so I can just about see on this camera there whether or not I'm gonna be nice and true in my space. So that's not bad. Right, let me get out and show you what I mean. So here we go. Um, we are pretty much bang smack in the middle. You don't get a great deal of room <laughs> at the side. So I'm overhanging the front by that much. And I am pretty much bang in line with it. So the simple answer is this car fills a car park space about as closely as you're gonna fill a car park space. Now then the next thing, I had so many questions. I just couldn't fit them all in and do them justice for all of them. So what I thought I would do for some of the quicker to answer questions is I'm gonna pull over on a nice spot somewhere and I'm gonna answer as many of your questions as I can in 60 seconds. The most questions I can answer in 60 seconds. Are you ready? Three, two, one, go. Okay, uh, Harry and Andy Miller want to know this or an RS6. 
RS6. Uh, Steve Dare, Ian Beard, Gary Taylor, what's the most money you can spend on the configurator? I got up to £99,500, which is weird because I think the press list price of this car is wrong. Is it worth £106 or £100,000? Alan Deacon asked. Uh, no, I think probably eighty-five. I reckon. Uh, Paul Hackett, does it have the same feel-good factor as a Range Rover? Um, no, not for me. Dale Fox, would it hold its value compared to a Range Rover? I think they'll both lose money at about the same rate. Uh, Davey, uh, uh, if you ha could have another SUV diesel uh, over the Escalade, what would it be? It would be a Range Rover autobiography. Um, Keith Morris, uh, would you have an SQ8 or a Macan Turbo and change? I'd have a Macan GTS and even more change. Uh, Dale Ashby, what's the towing capacity? It's 3,500 kilos. Um, ENG, does it have the enjoyment and luxury compared to the S4? S4 has more enjoyment, this has more luxury. And Andrew Lord, what's the sound system like? It's not bad. I might think I just went over a bit there, but I finished my list. Hurrah! There you go. I did my very, very best. Now, I must say a huge thank you to everybody who's taken the time and effort to send me their questions. I love doing these collaboration reviews. I think they're great fun and a great way to get you guys involved in the car. I'm very lucky to drive these cars and often I have a story or a theme that I want to put across on a review but every now and again that story or that theme is just getting you guys involved and it's really special to be able to do that so thank you very very much for all your questions. Now there are a couple of things that haven't been covered in this video but were questions that were sent in. So Robert Langham and Alan Butterfield, for example, both asked questions around fuel economy. Now I am, during this week, filming another video which will drop on the channel very shortly, basically living with this car for a week. I do a lot more about mileage and MPG and fuel economy in the Living With video, so make sure you tune into that one, guys. But I have to say a huge thank you to Audi UK for letting me play with a car for a week. It is a hugely impressive car. Um, I think it looks brilliant. It certainly kind of gets the, the, the stares and the glances and the admiration from people as you drive past. This particular spec is properly murdered out. Um, is it a car for me? Um, Probably not. Um, I, I like the practicality, I like the looks. For the money, however, there are other options that would probably tick more boxes for me. But I hope you've enjoyed the format. Thanks once again to all that sent questions through. Um, but if you have enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. Comments below are always welcome. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to Petroped for plenty more content to come. And I'll see you on the next film. Um, but you take care, guys. Drive safe.